This is an interesting text, and it's probably one of the most misunderstood texts in Scripture, because we read this text wrongly, or at least we tend to. Jesus says, unless your virtue goes deeper than the virtue of the scribes and the Pharisees, you will not enter the kingdom of heaven. Now, the, the reason why we misunderstand that is because this, we, we always think that the scribes and Pharisees in their worst light. You know, the scribes and Pharisees, they were, some of them were hip, hypocritical, they opposed Jesus. But the scribes and Pharisees, don't, don't get them wrong, they were the religious people of the time, the churchgoers, the theologians, the bishops, the priests, and so on. Today were the scribes and Pharisees, okay? They were the religious people of the time, and most of them were very good people. Jesus came from a school of the Pharisees, you know? And notice here Jesus isn't saying, if you are hypocritical like the scribes and Pharisees. Here he's talking about their virtue. Notice this, your virtue has to go deeper than the virtue of the scribes and Pharisees. Now what was the virtue of the scribes and Pharisees? Actually, it was a very high virtue. The scribes and Pharisees, in their religiosity, to be a virtuous person, you had to keep all the Ten Commandments, and you had to be a person, a man or a woman of justice. Now, it's interesting. If you keep all the commandments and you're a just person, why isn't that enough? You'd think, you know, if you keep the commandments and you're a very fair person, why isn't that enough? That's still not mercy. Well, Jesus is going to define it. Jesus says your virtue has to go deeper than the virtue of the scribes and Pharisees. Why? He said, because anybody can love those who love you, just as anybody can hate those who love who hate them. Anybody can do good to those who do good to you, just as anybody can wish evil on those who do evil to you. He said, but I say to you, can you love an enemy? Can you do good to those who do harm to you? Ultimately, can you... Forgive a murderer. It's interesting. That's the key, the highest moral point of the New Testament in terms of explicit teaching. And this takes you further than virtually any moral teacher on earth. Notice Jesus says, you know, if you're fair, it's still not enough. See, because justice doesn't include mercy. You know, and he said, and, it's, and besides, it's a little easier to do it. You know, if somebody loves you, it's easy to love them back. People come up to you and say, I think you're a great person, a great young priest, well, old priest. <laughs> I'd say, well, you're obviously bright and you have good taste and so on, you know. <laughs> See, you're someone who's up to say, I hate you. Well, I hate you too. Notice there's no virtue in that. You're just like an electrical cord. We just give back the energy that, that comes out to us, us, you know. And we spontaneously like the people who like us. We spontaneously hate the people who hate us. And actually, that's fair. It's fair. You may, in fairness, hate somebody who hates you, Okay. Jesus said, I'm asking you something. I'm saying, love those who hate you. Forgive those who do evil to you. And ultimately, forgive murderers. It's interesting, little footnote here. We've had popes since St. Peter. It was only the second last pope in our lifetime, John Paul II, who stood up and said, we shouldn't do capital punishment. Now, it's interesting. He didn't say capital punishment's wrong, because in fact, capital punishment is not wrong biblically you're allowed to do capital punishment. John Paul said, we shouldn't do capital punishment, even though we're allowed to do it, because Jesus is calling us to something higher. See, Jesus says, forgive murderers. Jesus forgave his own murderers while they were murdering him. So he said, we're called to something higher. You can execute a criminal. Jesus said, but you shouldn't do it. You should forgive those who kill your kids. You know, you don't have to. See, the virtue of the scribes and Pharisees, justice in the commandments is still an eye for an eye, a tooth for a tooth. You can hate somebody who hates you. See, Jesus here is defining mercy. He says, mercy is beyond justice. In justice, you can execute a criminal. In mercy, you forgive a criminal. In justice, you can hate somebody who hates you. In, in mercy, you say, no, you have to love those who, who hate you. It's interesting, you know, sometimes, again, in a little footnote, recently you've had a lot of stuff with, you know, because the religious right and left fighting with each other, and people oftentimes say, what's the litmus test to a Christian? What's the litmus test that makes you a Christian? And oftentimes people will pick a moral issue, abortion. That's the litmus test. Now, if you want the litmus test, this is the litmus test. 
Can you love and forgive an enemy? Can you forgive a murderer? That's the litmus test Jesus gives us. He says, that stretches you morally to where Jesus wants us to be. See, so mercy is beyond justice. In justice, you can execute a criminal. In mercy, you shouldn't. And actually, John Paul was very nuanced on his thing on capital punishment. He didn't say capital punishment's wrong. He said, in fact, capital punishment is allowable, biblically. He said, but we shouldn't do it. <laughs> you don't have to forgive an enemy, but you're supposed to. See, Jesus calls us, that again, when Victoria talked that the bigger mind. See, and in the small mind, you don't have to forgive an enemy. The big mind calls you to forgive enemies, to love those who hate you. That's, that's mercy, as Jesus defined it. Then, the next one. In John 2, compassion and mercy as giving voice to human finitude. I want to run you through a story here of Jesus that has many levels to it, and we only get the first level, and, and oftentimes don't miss some of the second and third levels of the story. And that's the famous story of the wedding feast of Cana. That's a story early on in John's Gospel, and interesting enough, it's a story preeminently about Mary, not about Jesus. This is the way John writes the story. He says, there was a wedding feast in Cana, and the mother of Jesus was invited to come, and Jesus also came along. So notice he's the tag along. Okay. So Jesus tags along. His mother is invited to this wedding in Cana. Now, interesting, too, in John's Gospel, remember, I think I told you this last week, in the Synoptic Gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, that's one. The Synoptic Gospels, they write up Jesus from the point of view of his humanity. He's a human being who also is God. John reverses that. In John's Gospel, Jesus has no humanity. He is God from the beginning to the end. You know, the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God, and the Word became flesh. So in, in John's Gospel, Jesus has no humanity. So notice, Mary is going to a wedding feast, but she's taking God along. Okay? And also in John's Gospel, Mary has a unique role. John never mentions her name. If you didn't have the other Gospels, you wouldn't know what Mary's name is, you know? In the other Gospels, Mary is a prototype of discipleship. In John's Gospel, she isn't. In John's Gospel, she becomes Eve. And that's why he never gives it. She's always the mother of Jesus, or she's called woman. Okay, a generic title. You can see at the wedding feast of Cana, Jesus doesn't say mother. He says woman, okay? So you're going to see there's two levels to this text. One is the level we get the level of hospitality and so on, Mary talking to Jesus. You're going to see the deeper level is Eve, the mother of humanity, talking to God. Okay, so that's the setup. So the mother of humanity is invited to a wedding feast, and biblically a wedding feast means to the center of life. You know, in all archetypal literature, even fairy tales, remember how notice how all fairy tales end with a wedding? Every good fairy tale is to end with a wedding. The prince and princess get married and they live happily ever after. That's, a, that's eschatology. That means that's heaven. Heaven is, you, 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 and you live happily ever after. The, the, the genders come together, everything's complete, you live happily ever after. So the, the great texts in scripture that deal with heaven or the center of life, the center of life on earth is symbolized by a wedding feast. So you have Mary and Jesus are going to the center of life. And at a second level, the mother of humanity, Eve and God, are going to the wedding feast. So they come there. This is the text. It said, at the heart of the feast, the mother of Jesus turned to Jesus and said, they have no wine. What an incredible thing to say. You know, because you notice wine, wine is not a protein. <laughs> you don't, you know. You know, wine isn't a health food. Wine isn't something you need to sustain your life. Wine is an extra. Wine is about bubbliness of spirit, about celebration, about, you know, celebrating life, about exuberance, what's beyond the ordinary, okay? Now, let's first take the surface level. And this is the way the text is often preached, and it's, it's a valid way. And, and that is, see, Mary, she's a sensitive one. She comes to the wedding. They've run out of wine. And you don't have to be, probably don't have to guess why. Undoubtedly, it was some slip up, or they didn't have enough money, or whatever. See, and it's embarrassing for the people. Mary doesn't want them embarrassed. You know, she's not interested in 
Not saying, well, I haven't had mine yet. <laughs> okay. She's trying to save the hosts from embarrassment. And so she goes to Jesus that they don't have any wine. Okay. Now, that's the, the surface level. And it, that's, that's valid. You can preach on that. You know, the sensitivity, hospitality. Also, that Mary's the great intercessor. You can intercede with Mary and she intercedes with Jesus. But, but that isn't the role, the, the deeper part of this text, you know. See, what Mary is giving voice to, she's, she's the mother. She's our mother, and she's the mother of humanity, and she's giving voice to human finitude. See, what mercy asks us to, that's a prophetic text. Mercy asks all adult Christians to voice what the poor can't voice. You know, the couple there who ran out of wine, they couldn't voice that. Mary voiced it for them, you know, and that symbolizes human finitude. There's a certain poverty at the heart of life. Somebody has to speak for that. See, the, Mary is a merciful person. She gives voice to human finitude. They have no wine, you know. And then it's interesting, Jesus says to her, woman, it's a heck of a thing to call your mother. I never said that to you, my mom. No, woman, he said, what's that to you and I? What's that to God? And what's that to Eve? Then he says, my hour has not yet come. And that's the part we also misunderstand. When Jesus says, my hour hasn't come, he isn't saying, you know, my hour to do miracles. He's not saying, you know, mom, the father and I have a schedule. And, <laughs> and, and miracles kick in at about, you know, it's a, it's a three-year schedule, about a year and a half in, we start doing miracles and so on. Now, the hour he's referring to is not the hour to do miracles. It's the hour of his death his suffering. He's saying, I'm not sure I'm the person who can provide the wine because I haven't had to put out blood yet, you know. But then, in fact, he does the miracle. And uh, there's many aspects to it beyond. I just want to emphasize the mercy, the finitude thing. But in there, it's interesting. Notice the water that he turns into wine isn't the drinking water, you know. At, at the door of a Jewish house, there were always six jugs and they each held about 18 gallons, and that was water to wash yourself in, you know. So to go to the table, you had to ablute yourself, your hands and your feet, you know. And it was, um, was also needed because they walked barefoot in dust and so on. But it was also a symbolic thing. You could only go to the table if you were clean. So this was the water to wash yourself with so you'd be purified to go to the table. It's not the drinking water. They didn't drink that water. So Jesus turns that water into wine. He turns it into the best wine of all. And there the miracle, you know, which actually it's interesting. John at this stage doesn't use the word miracle. John says it was Jesus' first sign. See, miracles are too clear cut. You don't have to think about a miracle. The guy walked on water. Well, that's something. <laughs> you know, see, a sign you have to think about. So John says this was a sign that Jesus worked. Because we need to think about it. And... Um, there's a double meaning to the water. First of all, what brings joy and life and wine into community is not necessarily the fiesta times. It's got to be the ordinary wash water, the laundry, the Monday morning. That's where joy has to happen. But also, that's a symbol of the Eucharist. You know, in the beginning of John's Gospel, um, and we're going to look at another text in a few minutes, in the, the first chapters of John's Gospel are all this, where Jesus takes the old and he replaces it with the new. And here, part of the miracle or the sign is that you used to be worthy to go to the table, to the wedding feast, by washing yourself with his water, and now he turns it into wine that's also the wine of the Eucharist. The great act of washing yourself clean, the sacrament of reconciliation for Christians, penance and confession comes later, it's the Eucharist. The Eucharist, the primary sacrament of reconciliation, that's the way in this life you ready yourself to enter into the banquet. And because John is really complicated, notice in his gospel, the water becomes the wine, and then the wine's going to become the blood. And then at the end of John's gospel, when they pierce Jesus' side, blood and water flows out. So the blood and water flows back on humanity. Um, this is symbol upon symbol upon symbol. But the point I want to make here in terms of mercy he gives Mary this unique role. See, Mary is the merciful mother. Eve, the mother of humanity, she gives voice to human finitude. She's saying they don't have any wine. You know, I'm at the center of life, the center of the heart of humanity, and it's flat down here. They've got protein. 
Notice she didn't say, I looked in their fridge, and they only have Doritos and, Doritos and Coke, you know. Uh, they didn't, they maybe had a lot of protein. They didn't have joy at the center of life. And so she gives voice to that. She gives voice to something very concrete. This poor couple didn't have enough money to do a proper wedding for their kid, you know. She voices that to God. See, so mercy, we're merciful adults to the degree that we give voice to human finitude. That's what prophets do. That's what uh, true generative adults do. They worry about who hasn't got enough and so on. Um, it's interesting, uh, Elizabeth Johnson, in her last book on abounding grace, she talks about how important it is to have more feminine images of God, you know. And she says, um, precisely for this reason, she says, any mother who's feeding seven kids makes sure they all get some. <laughs> okay. She said, um, see, she said, a feminine image of God would help us give more voice to, finit voice to human finitude here. Okay. That's number three. Up to number six, uh, five. Okay. okay. Then, Luke 10, compassion is reaching through the ecclesial and cultural norms to reach the poor. That is the famous story of the Good Samaritan. Now again, these stories, they make a point all by themselves, but you've got to contextualize and tease them out. Okay. Now here, Jesus is defining mercy as something that reaches through the cultural and ecclesial norms of the time. So this is the story of the Good Samaritan. You know, let me repeat it briefly. Jesus says, one day a man was walking between from Jerusalem to Jericho when he fell among robbers who beat him up and left him for dead by the ditch. And then a priest comes walking by. Now, the priest was the highest religious person. Surely he should stop, <laughs> you know, but he doesn't stop. And the reason he doesn't stop is precisely because he's a priest. See, he couldn't stop, not because he was busy, but see, he didn't know if this guy was dead. And if a priest touched the dead body, then he polluted himself, and he couldn't do sacrifice and so on. So this priest, precisely because he's religious, can't reach out to this person, okay? So he passes by the other side of the road, very careful not to touch the wounded person, okay? Then a scribe comes along. And see, the scribe represents wisdom. That's the smartest person in the country comes along, and he sizes this up, but he passes by the other side of the road. Now, we don't know his reasons, but obviously they have to do with human wisdom. You know, the way we say, don't give money to a street person, they're just going to drink it up, you know. And then you're enabling this. He probably did all his psychology courses and all his social, sociology of poverty, and he did the thing. No, I'm not really helping him. If I help him and so on, you know, I'm enabling him perhaps. <laughs> so whatever his wisdom was, his wisdom made him pass by, which also makes us often pass by, you know. And you have that decision every time you stop at a corner and there's somebody out there begging with a, with a, with a cardboard sign. Do you give him a dollar? Do you not? You've been told not to. You know, we're always told, don't give any money to these people, you know. Well, maybe he was told, don't uh, help, you know. So anyway, he passes by. Then a Samaritan comes along. The Samaritan were the, were the enemies of the Jew, the Jews. So this guy comes along. He has every reason to kill this man. But Jesus says he was moved by human compassion. See, human compassion is something deeper than religiosity. It's something deeper than the wisdom of the classrooms and cultural wisdom. He said he was simply moved in his gut. And one human being to the other, he went across, he bound up the man's wounds, he took him to an inn, and then not only that, he wrote him a blank check. He said, I'm going away, and if you spend more money, I want to come back, I want to see this thing right to the end. See, image of human mercy. So first of all, mercy, um, there are times, like all of us in this room, we're religious. All of you have had, you know, courses and cultural wisdom with street people, with the poor. What do you do? What's wise? What isn't? And Jesus said, sometimes mercy simply reaches right through that. Sometimes you've got to bracket your religion. Sometimes you've got to bracket all your university training and all your cultural norms. And you say, this person needs my help. And you reach out. It's Jesus. That's what the, that's, you, you, you can't cut this parable any other way. You know, 
you can't rationalize this parable, you can't make it go away, then this is one of the central parables of Jesus, you know, that, or people say today, well, no, really, you shouldn't be, you know, it's interesting, I'll give you an example. Mother Teresa was canonized on Sunday, <clears throat> and not everybody was enthusiastic about her canonization, you know, and one of the major things she was criticized about was for doing this. They said, but she wasn't really helping these people, and you know, and social justice is correct. There's systemic reasons, and she was just treating the bodies, and she wasn't looking up the river, why these, and so on. And all of that is true, but she was the Good Samaritan. She just reached out, said, I don't care about, you know, what people think, or if corporations are giving me the money, or whatever, I'm just going to, this person's dying, and there's nobody there, I'm going to be there, you know. Now, we also have to keep cultural norms and religion in mind, but here Jesus is saying, at times, mercy simply trumps all of that. There comes times when Jesus says, be danged about religion, be danged about university courses and, and even social justice and so on. Sometimes you simply have to reach out to this person. You also have to do mercy, social justice, and everything else. You know how that we find that the, the distinction between justice and, I mean, uh, social justice and charity? It's an important distinction. A lot of people don't get that. You know, for instance, you can be a very charitable person and not a just person. You can be a very just person and not a charitable person. So it, this is the classical story that and I used it in the book, The Holy Longing. They say, and this is the classical story. And we'll put it to the Good Samaritan. They say, once upon a time there was a town and they lived down the bend from a river. And one day some kids were playing and they went out and they found five bodies were floating on the river. So they called the adults and they quickly pulled these bodies out. Three of them were dead, so they buried them. One was a kid, so they found a foster home for him. And one was a young man and they rehabilitated him and gave him a job. And the next day they went out and a couple more bodies came. And they went on for years. They'd go out every day and there'd be bodies coming on the river and they would handle them. You know, the kids they'd put to uh, foster homes, put them in schools, the, the, you know, the sick they would tend to, the, the dead ones they'd bury, and they did this for years. But they never thought of going up the river to see why those bodies were coming from. See, now, now there's charity, see, up the river, that's social justice, and it's very important. See, why are we producing bodies, you know? Right now, if you watch the news, what's happening in Chicago that 60 people got killed in a week? You know, remember the police chief just yesterday said, you know, this isn't a police problem, it's a society problem. What's causing those bodies? Now, Mother Teresa and the Good Samaritan are down the river. Notice Mother Teresa wasn't up the river looking at justice. She was saying, this person's sick, this person's leprosy, nobody can touch this person, they'll touch them. You know, the Good Samaritan wasn't looking up the river. He didn't say, well, I wonder why the crime rate is high in Jericho. <laughs> That's somebody else's job. This guy was lying in the ditch, bleeding. He picked him up. See, so mercy. This parable, and you, you can't rationalize this parable away. People would like to, you know. Well, don't really, you're not really helping this street person. You gotta get him to a social agency, yes. But at a certain time, mercy is simply a direct one-to-one. -one. And it's just that he was moved by human compassion. And he just went across the ditch and picked up this guy. And then his mercy was also unconditional. He said, I'm going to see this thing through to the end. If it costs more money, I'll pay it. You know, he didn't say, he's out of my hands now, innkeeper. Good luck. As the French say, arrangez-vous. <laughs> I'm off. Okay. Um, okay, that's, that's mercy. Now, Luke 15. Compassion and mercy as a wide, inclusive heart as accepting difference and ambiguity, and then it's also echoed in Matthew 13, 24 to 30. <clears throat> Last week we did Luke 15, and I gave you the parable of the good Samaritan, I mean the, the, the prodigal son, prodigal father, the woman with the coins, the sheep. So I'm going to do the Matthew text tonight. <clears throat> Compassion is dealing with ambiguity, okay? That is the famous text, of, text in Scripture of the wheat and the darn all. So Jesus says, I want to tell you a parable. There was a farmer, and he sowed wheat in his field. And while he was asleep, his enemy came and sowed darnel. And the wheat and darnel came up together, and his servants came and said, your field is full of darnel. Should we go out and pull it up 
And the master said, no, because you're also going to pull up a lot of the wheat. You have to wait till they both are ripe. And in the harvest, we'll separate the wheat from the darnel. Okay. The wheat will put into bins. The darnel will be burned. <clears throat> now, you've got to be a farmer to understand that. I grew up on a farm. Wheat and darnel, they look exactly the same until they're ripe. See, so if you go and you want to weed a garden, you can tell the difference between a cabbage plant and a weed, between a carrot plant and a weed. You can weed your garden because the weeds look different than the vegetables. But wheat and darnel look exactly the same when they're growing. So you can't go out and pull the darnel out because you don't know what's darnel and what's wheat. Okay? And Jesus said, you got to wait till they mature, and then you can separate them. Now, that's a parable calling us to mercy, calling us to, to put up with human ambiguity. See, so that who's good and who's bad. You know, a lot of times you don't know. This looks, you know... Jesus, you got to live with a lot of unresolved tension, you know, until it's ready to be sorted out. Too often, you know, you know we, we divide the world too quickly into good guys and bad guys. These are evil, these are good, so on, you know. Um, Jesus said, be careful, be very, be very slow to judge. And at times he says, don't judge. Don't judge and you won't be judged, you know. See, so this, this is... Um, <clears throat> This is a statement against the overcritical mindset. You know, great people live with great ambiguity. When we're not great, we need clarity all the time. Life is black and white. Good, bad. So black, white. Jesus says, no, this, uh, most of that is shades of gray, you know. Put up with each other, you know. Um, you know, we, we need to learn to live with ambiguity. One of the great philosophers I ever studied under was Tom Francoeur, French-Canadian. And Tom used to say this in class, try this line out for size. Tom would always say, that's ambiguous enough, I can live with that. <laughs> see, see, most people say, that's clear, I want some clarity. Tom would say, that's ambiguous enough, I can, I, can, I can deal with that. You know, the lines are not that hardly drawn. You know, it's right, it's wrong. This guy's in, you're out. Jesus says, no. <laughs> At the end, the judge is going to decide who's in and who's out. And in the meantime, good can look like bad, and bad can look like good, and we got, we got to live with that ambiguity. Mercy means patience. Mercy means not judging too quickly. Sometimes mercy means not judging at all. Living and letting live, and see where it goes. And remember, Jesus said the ultimate way of discern is how. He said, by your fruits you'll know them. But the fruit is when the plant is ripe. He doesn't say in its infant stage you can tell the, the weeds from the, from, from the wheat. He said, in their maturity you can. By their fruits you'll know them. In the meantime, it calls us to live with great patience, with frustration, with ambiguity, and, you know, patience with each other. It's mercy. Okay. Um, the next one. So that was, mercy is a wide, inclusive heart, accepting ambiguity. Now, compassion and mercy are not being the money changer who blocks access to the temple. Notice that's the second story we have from John chapter 2. You know, I was talking before about John's gospel. John's gospel is really different than the other gospels. See, in the other gospels, they're like a chronology. You have the Annunciation, then Jesus is born, then you have the infant Jesus, and you have... Jesus is a 12-year-old, and then his public life, and so on. John just eliminates all of that. See, so John says, the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, and the Word was God, the Word became flesh, and halfway through chapter 1, Jesus is adult, he's, he's baptizing people, he's out there. Okay, so there's no infant Jesus, 12-year-old Jesus, Jesus, John just gets them. So by chapter 2, all the important things are already happening. Okay, and in chapter 2, Jesus is replacing something old and a cherished religious tradition with something new. And that's also what you have to understand this text. This is a vastly under-understood and misunderstood text in Scripture, and that's the cleansing of the temple, you know, where Jesus chases the money changers out with the whips and cords and upsets their tables and so on. Well, it's interesting. In the other Gospels, he does it at the end of the Gospel, in fact, in the other Gospels, this is what seals his fate. 
They want to kill him, but they're still holding off until he does this. And then he seals his feet. But in John's Gospel, it's right at the beginning. So he, he cleanses the temple as, as almost the second act that he does. Now, what is the meaning of that text? Where I said it's often misunderstood because people always say, that, that's where you see violence in God. Remember last week I said, there is no violence in God. Okay? And here they say, well, well Jesus kicked over the tables and all that. And, uh, okay, give me some background to this text. Who were the money changers? Okay? Well, the money changers had a very important place in the temple and in, in the commerce of the time. See, the money changers, they weren't selling statues and holy water and pamphlets and stuff, you know. And uh, <clears throat> in fact, if you go, I, I love the new cathedral in Los Angeles. There's a Starbucks right in the church. I like that. <clears throat> People will hang around after mass for a while, you know. That's not what Jesus is against, okay? See, the money changers are very important. They had a very important role. The temple was an international place where Jews came from all over the world and they had to offer sacrifice, but they couldn't bring the sacrifice if they're coming from Turkey or Greece or Syria and so on. They would bring their own currency. So they would bring Greek drachma, they'd bring you know, Syrian currency and so on, and they had to exchange it to buy. So for instance, if you go to, to a foreign country, actually it often doesn't work with Americans because most people take American dollars, but every other place in the world will understand this. <laughs> you know, if you go to another country, you have to exchange your currency into their currency. You know? So if you go to Europe, you've got to change dollars into euros, and then you buy with euros. See, so the money changers were like our banks. Then they had a very important function. So people would come to the temple from all over the world, and they would bring their money, they would change it into to, to Jewish drachma, and, uh, or shekels, and so on, and then they would buy the animals to sacrifice in the temple, and they'd buy their lunch and, from vendors, and so on. Now, these, these money changers, probably like all money changers, took a little cut, you know? That's not what he was upset about. He didn't say, you're dishonest, and so on. He says, you have turned my father's house into a market square, but he wasn't talking about you build a Starbucks here. You're going to see what he means by the market square. You know, what he's doing is this. He, he's saying, this is the principle, and I'll, I'll, I'll tease it out for you. He's saying, from now on, remember he, in John's gospel, he's replacing the old with the new. He said, in former days, to be a pious Jew, you have to change your other currency into Jewish currency to work in, wash in this temple. He says, you don't have to anymore. Now all currencies work. And he kicks over the money tables. Notice he doesn't kill anybody, doesn't kick, uh, hurt anybody. He just kicks over the money tables and so on. And he drives them out symbolically from the temple. Why? He's teaching this point. Let, let me give it with a, with a different story. Just a chapter later in John's Gospel, he's going to meet the Samaritan woman at the well. <clears throat> and in John's Gospel, she's going to become the first believer in John's Gospel, the first person who converts. So he's having this conversation with the Samaritan woman. It's very interesting. And at one point, the Samaritan woman says to him, um, you know, I'm a Samaritan, and the Jews said you have to worship in the temple in Jerusalem, and the Samaritans say you have to worship up on Mount Garrison, so where do I have to worship? And Jesus says you don't have to worship on any of those places. The temple's in the heart. See, after Jesus, you can worship anywhere. It doesn't have to be Rome, Salt Lake City, Mecca, um, Jerusalem, wherever. Someplace. Jesus says, the temple is everywhere. See, you don't have to turn your currency into an... This is actually a very, very radical text. You know, and it upset all the temple commerce. You know, it's like somebody say, you don't have to be a Roman Catholic to be saved. Well, you'd, you'd be suspended pretty quickly if you're a Catholic, you know. Jesus is, in effect, saying that. He's saying, you don't have to go through anybody to get to God. You know, see, and the real danger, you know who the money changers are today? I'm one of them. Priests and parish teams say, you want your kid baptized? You're going through me, you know. And you're going to take six courses, or I'm not going to do it for you, and so on. See, those are money changers. They're saying, you know, um, uh, 
you know, or if you don't go to church, you can't go to heaven and so on. Uh, he's saying, no, no, we're money changers. Jesus would kick a lot of us out. You know, he's saying, like, you, you don't have to go through anybody anymore. You have direct access to God through Jesus, okay? You know, sometimes when I say this, people say, well, then what's the value of the church? If you can go to heaven without going to church, if you can go to heaven without priests and parish councils and RCA programs and catechesis and catechisms and priests and so on, um, what's the value? Well, you know what the church is? The church is a very valuable GPS. You can save yourself a half of a lifetime of fiddling around on bad roads. <laughs> See, the church will say, <clears throat> recalculating, I think you want to do this. And so, See, the church is, it's a, you, you can go somewhere without a GPS. You might get lost a lot, and you might, you know, spend 10 extra hours getting there. You know, a GPS can be really valuable. Religions are really valuable. They figured out the roads and so on. They said, you want to get to heaven, and then we can direct you. Turn right, turn left, you know, go to this confessional, turn to the other place and so on. Um, and then recalculating. <laughs> every time you screw up and so on. See, that's what the church is. But it's not, you're going through me or you don't go to heaven. See, these money changers say, you're going through us or you can't worship in the temple. See, that's, that's the real thing. So Jesus is saying, we have to be merciful enough to, as church to realize it isn't through us. You know, I was in New York City three years ago on a Sunday in May. So if I'm in New York City, I'm gonna to go to St. Patrick's Cathedral. It's the Cathedral of Roman Catholicism in the United States. So I went there on Sunday, and the homily was just awful. And I don't say that very often, you know. I like most homilies, but the priest said this. The priest said, you know, Jesus said, I'm the vine, we're the branch. And the branches said, the Catholic Church, the Roman Catholic Church is the vine. You're the branches, but if you disconnect, you can't go to heaven. He said, and the way you connect is going to Mass on Sunday. And if you don't go to Mass on Sunday, you know, it's a mortal sin. And if you die like that, you'll go to hell. And he said, I know you don't want to hear this, so I'll say it again to repeat it. You know? <laughs> See, that's a money changer. Very sincere man. These money changers were sincere. You're, there's one way to go there. You're going through me. You're going through this parish council. You're going through this parish. You're going through this sacramental program. And... Uh, you might say, no, I don't have to. <laughs> See, all currency works. Basically what this saying, take that, this text means all currency works for God. Interesting, I'll give a little footnote to that too, and a uh, uh, subsequent thing to it. You know, um, a few years ago, um, and again, I like this guy, so I'm saying this gently, but when Benedict was Pope, Benedict was really hoping to restore Latin to the church, you know. And Benedict really believed that it's, it's the, the, the language for church. That, you know, Catholicism, Christianity, is a language of Latin. And the theologians just absolutely clubbed him into submission. They said, it's completely wrong, you know. Latin's a beautiful language, don't get me wrong. I had to study Latin for six years and so on. And um, now I don't get a chance to use it anymore. <laughs> It's a, it's a beautiful language. It's just one language. It's not a privileged language. And why do I say this? Because Christianity is a language of translation. Christianity, in general, is a language of translation. And you see that at Pentecost. Pentecost happens, and they come out of the Pentecost room. And then, the, then Luke, who writes this up, Luke says, everybody heard the gospel spoken in their own language. He didn't, the people didn't say, wow, I can understand Greek. I understand Latin. They said, no, I understand the gospel in my own language. See, there is no privileged language in Christianity. There is in, for instance, the Muslims, there's a privileged language. The Koran has to be read in this language and so on. In Christianity, or even in Judaism, a bit of a language, you know, that, that Hebrew is privileged. In Christianity, we've tried to privilege Latin, and it's, it's not to be put. Christianity is, the Holy Spirit speaks all the languages. And all the languages are equal. And see, here Jesus says, all currency works to get to God. So he's taking away 
anybody who says, you got to go through me, you got to go through this, Jesus says, no, you don't. You know, you're a money changer. Okay. It's interesting. They, there, there's other subtler things in that. Remember in the Synoptic Gospels, there's an incident where Jesus is preaching in a house and they're trying to get a sick person to him and they can't. And so they have to go up on the roof and they take some boards off the roof and then lower the sick person. That must be quite a scene. Jesus said, oh, really? they're ferrying this guy down and so on. <laughs> See, but the same thing. There's people, the people around Jesus are blocking somebody from getting to him. We got to be real careful. We're the people around Jesus that we aren't blocking access. You know, as a theologian, I worry about that. Everything I say, that, am I blocking access to Jesus? Am I blocking access to God? See, the money changers, they were blocking access to God. You know, they're saying, you got to go through me, you know. And they got a little prof profit angle to it. You know, um, I, I wish I could, they will never invite me, but I wish I could speak to parish councils <laughs> <laughs> and people who run parish programs and say, you know, be careful, be careful how programmatic you are. Say, you don't go to this program, we're not going to baptize your kid, you know. They have a right to baptism. You know, you don't have a right to stop them. You can invite them to take courses, but they have a right to the sacraments, you know. And so um, we got to be real careful. This is a strong text. And incidentally, it did Jesus in. That's the, in, in the Synoptic Gospel said that at the end, and that's the straw that breaks the camel's back. When Jesus chases them out, so, so much was around temple commerce. He upset the whole economic system by doing that, you know. Um, but it also upset the religious people really, really badly, you know, to say, like, what if they don't have to go through us? <laughs> and Caiaphas says, I think it's better we kill one person for the people, and that one person was Jesus, you know. Um, this is pretty strong doctrine, but it's, it's, I'm not making this stuff up. Okay. <laughs> okay. So compassion is not being a money changer. You know, you have to be always cautious. I'm not um, blocking access to Christ. Now, compassion is taking off our outer garments so as to wash each other's feet. Now, notice I'm leaning a lot on jo Jonah 9 texts here. Uh, John's gospel was written much later and is much more of a mystical gospel. Notice he hasn't got that strong narrative you have in Matthew, Mark, and Luke. So there's, there's, John, he, he's making mystical points. And this, this is, uh, and his gospel is also, also written very late, okay? So that they estimate that John's gospel is written somewhere between the year 90 and 100. Now, why is that important? Well, if Jesus died in 33, so we estimate Jesus died the year 33, John is writing his gospel some 70 years after Jesus' death. And he himself would have been a very old man. He must have been in his 90s, okay? He's the last living apostle. All the other apostles have been martyred by this time. John alone is alive. He's got to be in his 90s. And he writes this gospel, but he's seen 70 years of church life. And 70 years of church life then is like 70 years of church life now. <laughs> Which means they thought about everything. So by the time John writes this gospel, they're already, for instance, about the Eucharist. There are already about four different theologies of the Eucharist. Someone says, what's the theology of the Eucharist in the New Testament? Well, no, you make it plural. There are theologies of the Eucharist in the New Testament. By the time John died, they already were doing this. Some communities, like John's community, were celebrating Eucharist every day. Incidentally, that's where we get the Roman Catholic thing of daily Eucharist. And Christians who do Eucharist every day, that's Joe 9. Some of the other communities were celebrating it only on Sunday. Some were celebrating it only a few times a year. And so on. And they were arguing who can preside and, you know, and about rubrics and so on, the way we are today. And they had different names for it. Some were calling it the Lord's Supper. Some were calling it communion and so on. Much the same as today. So John is looking at all of this. Now it's very interesting. John um, has a Last Supper scene. In the other Gospels, the Last Supper is one paragraph. The night before I died, Jesus took bread, took wine, said, My body is my blood. In John's Gospel, the Last Supper is over half of the Gospel. Over half of the Gospel is a long speech that Jesus gives at the Last Supper. It's over half of John's Gospel. Okay? And it's all of Jesus' teaching. It's kind of as his fundamental teaching at the Last Supper. And very interesting. In John's Gospel, 
he doesn't mention the bread and wine at the Last Supper. See, in the other three Gospels, said, at the Last Supper, Jesus took bread, took wine, says, my body is my blood, do this in remembrance of me. John's Gospel, half the Gospel is the Last Supper, doesn't mention the bread and wine. And where the other Gospels have the bread and wine, he has to baste them in the towel. So that they said, see, the other Gospels, at the Supper, Jesus took bread, says, this is my body, took wine, this is my blood. John's Gospel said, at the Last Supper, Jesus got up from the table, took off his outer robe and began to wash the disciples' feet. So where the others have the bread and wine, John substitutes the basin and the towel. And it's very interesting, the Christian communities, Roman Catholics included and so on, notice the text we read on Holy Thursday, the gospel we read when we commemorate the, 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 the institution of the Eucharist. On Holy Thursday, we commemorate the institution of the Eucharist, we get to the gospel, they don't read about bread and wine, we read about the basin and the towel. Very interesting. See, what happened to the bread and wine? Okay. No. See, John substitutes them, because in John's gospel, he is a different Eucharistic theology. Eucharist is already going on in chapter 6. Remember, chapter 6 says, Jesus, I'm the bread of life. And the Eucharist is the daily manna. That's the way you go. Every day you need to eat fresh. God comes to you daily. It's like, like they fed the Israelites in the manna with in the desert with manna, God feeds us every day with his body and blood and so on. Okay. So when John gets to the Last Supper, instead of mentioning the bread and wine, not that he eliminates it, he just doesn't mention it, he substitutes the, the basin and the towel, and he's trying to make a very, very specific point. Now, this is actually a very deep text. And let me just quote it from my heart. And John writes this very carefully. He said, at the Supper, Last Supper, Jesus, knowing that he had come from God, and that he was going back to God, and that therefore all things were possible for him, got up from the table, took off his outer robe, and began to wash the disciples' feet against their protests. Now, this has two levels of meaning. And again, we get the first level. And this is the, the homiletics we get, and the iconography we get, and so on. The liturgy celebrates uh, the servitude, you know, where Jesus, the master, washes the servants' feet. See, that's what we celebrate in our, very much in, in our theology and, and you know, liturgy. You know, see, this is an act of humility, that Jesus got up, and he used the master, but he washed the servant's feet. And that's a powerful point. You know, remember a great poem by John Shea. And John Shea says, at the Last Supper, Jesus got up, and he took the mantle of privilege and turned it upside down and turned it into the apron of service. Isn't that a great line? You take the mantle of privilege and turn it into the apron of service. You know, so it's a great act of humility, but John has something else in mind. There are two kinds of acts of humility. Some are easy to do and some are hard to do, okay? Let me give you one that's a great act, but it's still easy to do. <clears throat> Imagine it's Christmas Day, and you go to church in the morning, and then before you do your Christmas dinner, you go downtown or to some homeless shelter and you help serve a meal to some homeless people. You did a wonderful thing, you know. And you go home and you shower and you clean up before you dinner and you feel good. You did something wonderful. It's an act of humility. See, you don't have to serve homeless people, but you did. Okay? But it's not that hard to do. And in fact, you, feel, you actually feel pretty good doing it. You still do it. It's a different kind of humility. When you have to reach across something. Let me give you an example of that. You know what I think John would do if he came back today? If I ask you this, what's the single most morally divisive issue in our culture? Abortion. Okay. You know what John would do if he came back today and say, let's not have arguing pro-life, pro-choice. Let's bring out a basin and towel, and we'll have pro-life wash pro-choice's feet. Then we'll have pro-choice wash pro-life's feet. Then we'll have Hillary Clinton wash Donald Trump's feet. We'll have Donald Trump wash Hillary Clinton's feet. We'll have Democrats wash Republican feet, Republicans, Democrats. Then we'll have Christian wash, Christian wash some Arab, Muslim feet. We'll have some Al-Qaeda people wash some Christian feet. And then maybe we have some chance for peace in our world. He said, that's what the Eucharist means, see? And that's a lot harder to do. It's one thing to feed a homeless person. It's another thing to reach across to somebody who's different than you. Look like Jesus, can you do that for an enemy, you know? And, uh, but now, there's something deep inside the text. On what basis does he do this? 
Okay? You know, they said, at the supper, Jesus, knowing he had come from God and was going back to God, got up from the table and took off his outer robe. Now, that's, a, that's an interesting thing. You know, when, on Holy Thursday, in your priest, you have to wash people's feet. Um, you have to take off your chasuble, otherwise it gets in the water, you know. And so it's a, this is what's kind of a practical thing. You have to, otherwise, you know, if you, this stuff is getting in the water, you know, but it's not the deep part of it. The outer robe is more than your outer clothing. Your outer robe and also all of your outer identities. He stripped himself down to just one identity. I've come from God, I'm going back to God. Okay? Now, you and I also have outer clothing and an inner identity. You know, what's our outer clothing? Well, I can give you mine. I'm a Roman Catholic, I'm a Caucasian, I'm a Canadian, I, I'm, I'm pro-life and on and on, and I'm an oblate of Mary Immaculate and all. So that's all, I speak English, so on. That, that's all my outer robe. And when I have that on, there's certain things I can't do. Then I can't wash the feet of somebody who's pro-choice. Okay? If you take that off, if you take off your outer clothing, your religion, your gender, your, your nationality, and so on, and then you only have one identity left. You've come from God, and you're going back to God, and therefore all things are possible for you. You can wash the feet of anybody on this entire planet. You can wash Hitler's feet. You know? See, because you're not wearing... Then notice afterwards, he puts them back on. After that's a, Then Jesus put his clothes back on. We normally need those clothes. <laughs> you know, they're not bad, but John's saying there come, again, mercy. Mercy, at a strict, there are times, it's like the Good Samaritan, where you take off all those clothes. Where it's a, it doesn't matter that I'm a priest. It doesn't matter I'm a Roman Catholic. It doesn't matter I'm a white, Caucasian, male, speaking English. All that, that's my outer clothing. It's very important. But at a certain point, mercy goes below. It's a, you simply have to take off your outer clothes and wash the feet of whoever is there. It's John's deepening of the parable of the Good Samaritan. Are you, are you getting this, sir? Okay. And it's, it's, it's really a wide-reaching um, thing. You know, in fact, I think this is the place in the gospel where someone says that stretches you further than any other place. Jesus says, you simply have to reach across all barriers, slave, Gentile, male, female, Catholic, you know, Christian, Arab, you have to reach across all those barriers. Because normally we wear clothes, you know, um, inner clothes, but there comes, comes a time when he says, your inner identity, the inner identity is the same for everybody in the world. You've come from God, and you're going back to God. And when we're wearing that inner identity only, then all things are possible for you. Notice how he writes that. Jesus said, Jesus realizing he had come from God, he was going back to God, and therefore all things were possible for him, took off his outer robe, and began to wash the disciples' feet. That's the Good Samaritan parable taken by John to new levels. It demands a lot of us.